Ok, ready? Uno, dos, tres. Muy buenos días y bienvenidos al servicio online de la iglesia Dublin Vineyard. Y... Ah, uh, wait a second, wrong language. Let's try that again. Well, the day has come. Today, the 11th of July, we're finally going back to in-person services. So today, exactly in 30 minutes at 11 a.m. in the YMCA 18 in Andrew Street, we are starting our in-person services after 16 months of not being able to do that. So let's just clap our hands for that. And those of you who got a ticket for that, well done. And if you want to be part of the service, if you want to be in the service, in, in, in the in-person service next week, the tickets will be open today after 5 p.m. and you can get them on our website, dublinvineyard.ie. So make sure that you get a ticket if you want to be in that in-person service. Of course, we will continue our online services because some of you are still not comfortable to go back or some of you are not in Dublin and cannot attend our services or many other reasons. So we will continue our online services at 10.30 a.m. like we've been doing for the last 16 months or less than that. Vineyard Kids, which is our kids ministry, is on a well-deserved summer break. They were meeting for the last few months on Zoom uh, at 9.30 a.m. Uh, so now they are on a well-deserved uh, break and we will give you more information when, when they will go back and how all that's going to work out. This morning, as we do every Sunday, we will have some time of worship. We will also have some time in the Word. We will continue the series on the Sermon on the Mount on the third tri trilogy, the third part of the trilogy. And you don't want to miss that sermon this morning. We also want to thank all of you who have shown an interest in being a volunteer to make the in-person services happen. It will take a lot of work and it takes a lot of coordination and actually quite a few people to make that happen. And we want to say, we want to say thank you to all those of you who have done that and expressed the interest in being part of that. And there are some of you who are doing that right now. They're getting ready for that in-person service. Thank you so much. Once again, thank you for tuning in. And now let's just transition into a time of worship where Matt and Jesse will lead us in a song called Raise a Hallelujah. Join me in worship.
So we're continuing our journey through the Sermon on the Mount, and I hope it's been as eye-opening for you as it has been for me, understanding that Jesus is just the go-to person for how to live life, and this is his uh, teaching on the way to experience and live into the fullness of life that he offers, that he is like the go-to person for life. Um, now we're up to uh, Matthew chapter 6, and I'm just going to read uh, the next part. We've looked at the two things that hinder uh, life in the kingdom of God. We've uh, seeking to get your value or identity out of and doing things for others to see. And then the second thing is, is securing your future, securing yourself on the basis of money rather than on God. Um, and then Jesus continues, Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any one of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? And the implication is, like, if you can't do that, like, don't worry. And why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow. They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you, not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into fire, will he not much more clothe you, O oh, you little faith ones? So do not worry saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the people of this world run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. And we had a great illustration of the flowers in, in the field just these past weeks. I don't know if you noticed, if you got out to any parks, like the bush Buttercups. It was just majestic yellow all across the meadows in the parks. And they're nearly gone now, or they are gone. If that's how God clothes the flowers in the field, how much more will he clothe you? So to summarize what Jesus is saying, he's saying, don't worry. Your father knows what you need. Seek his rule in your life, and he look after the other stuff. Or to make it even shorter, don't worry, trust God to look after you. That's kind of the summary of what Jesus is saying here. And actually, it's the story of God's people through the ages. Like if you think about Moses at the Red Sea, God is saying to him, don't worry Moses, I've got this. Joshua at Jericho, Joshua, don't worry, I've got this. And now God's solutions are always surprising, like parting the Red Sea and like marching around the walls of Jericho. Gideon, your army's too big. Make your army like 90% smaller and then relax. I've got this. David with Goliath, Elijah with the priests of Baal, Peter's escape from prison. And what Jesus is saying and what do not worry means, it means you're trusting God with the outcome of every situation and every circumstance. There's no need to worry, God has you covered. And as you read that, you kind of think, great, you'd be a fool not to pursue that. The good life, the easy life, because no worries, at least in our mind, in the world's mind, means no troubles. No troubles, no worries, it's the same thing. Then we read in verse 34, Jesus says, each day has enough trouble of its own. So that causes us to stop. So no need to worry isn't connected to a life of no trouble. So life in the kingdom of God breaks the connection between being worry-free and being trouble-free. Let me say that again. Life in the kingdom of God, it breaks the connection between being worry-free and being trouble-free. Like troubles can be adverse circumstances, setbacks, job losses, health issues, COVID. But life in the kingdom of God breaks the connection between the need to worry, 
because you've got troubles. So let's look at some instances of not worrying in the midst of trouble. Let's see how much that connection between being worry-free and trouble-free is broken. So this is from Hebrews chapter 11, starting in verse 32. What more shall I say? I do not have time to tell you about Gideon, who we've mentioned already, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, Samuel, and the prophets, who through faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice, and gained what was promised, who shut the mouths of lions, quenched the fury of the flames, escaped the edge of the sword, whose weakness was turned to strength, and who became powerful in battle and rooted foreign armies, women received back their dead, raised to life again. Don't worry. Troubles, none. But then it goes on. There were others who were tortured, refusing to be released so they might gain an even better resurrection. Some faced jeers and flogging, and even chains and imprisonment. They were put to death by stoning. They were sawn in two. They were killed by the sword. They went about in sheepskins and goatskins, destitute, persecuted, and ill-treated. The world was not worthy of them. They wandered in deserts and mountains, living in caves and in holes in the ground. These were all commended for their faith, yet not one of them received what had been promised, since God had planned something better for us, so that only together with us would they be made perfect. Like in that first passage, God is clearly caring for people listed in the first part. Lions' mouths are shut, flames are quenched, even dead husbands and sons were brought back to life. God in control, God's care evident. You have no need to worry. But what about these other guys, stoned to death and imprisoned, sawn in two, ill-treated, destitute? Does their life reflect the care of God? Do you think maybe God stepped away from them, even for a moment? It's clear from the context of the passage that's not the case. The worst happened to them but they continued in the abundance of God's care, God's presence, God's very being. Actually, it's kind of, you get a picture of it with uh, Stephen in the book of Acts. As he's being stoned, he gets a picture of Jesus standing there in heaven. Jesus evidently caring, evidently providing for Stephen in the midst of all that. What happened to Stephen? What happened to those people so on and two? Just like what happened to Jesus. Jesus lived his life in the knowledge and the care of his father. Stephen did, and these people did. So the disciples' reason for not worrying isn't that there won't be trouble. In the disciples' life, just like in everyone else's life, there is trouble today and there will likely be trouble tomorrow. So what is the disciples' reason for not worrying? The disciples' reason for not worrying is the kind of father the disciple has. The father who knows that you need things. So seek his rule and he'll look after everything. You see, these people came to know. They came first to understand and then to experience who the Father really was. Dallas Willard captures this perfectly, and he said, we must understand this, because the overflowing sufficiency that we would experience when Yahweh is our shepherd is in the all-sufficiency of the shepherd himself. The overflowing sufficiency that we would experience is in the all-sufficiency of the shepherd himself. If we do not understand the all-sufficiency of the shepherd, we will never experience that sufficiency in relationship to him. What we need, God has in infinite supply. And then he goes on to say, and like Israel, we too need, require a long, steady education in this direction because it doesn't make sense to us. Those who take time to increasingly come to know and trust God as he truly is are laying a sure foundation for a life in the kingdom of God, a life to the full. So what he's saying is that actually God is enough. God is all I need. 
And that is such a stretch for so many of us, particularly when we see the troubles in life. But remember, in the kingdom of God, that connection between worry and trouble is broken. That I don't need to worry because God is all I need and has all I need. Not simply what he gives us, but he himself. So David, when he was in the cave in Psalm uh, 142, he says, I cry to you, Lord. I say, you are my refuge, my portion in the land of the living. And there's a whole book called the Book of Sorrows or the Book of Lamentations in the Old Testament. And that's like a passionate expression of grief and sorrow. The whole book is entitled Lamentations and went through severe troubles. But the, the writer says, I say to myself, the Lord is my portion, therefore I will wait for him. The sufficiency is in God himself. It's not saying that we don't ask for rescue, but either way, God is sufficient. And not just believing it, but learning to trust that that's true by acting on it. Now remember, we're apprentices in this type of living, learning from Jesus, being with him, learning to be like him, doing what he did. And this is a long steady education for so many of us, me included. We can't just snap our fingers and say, God, I trust you in that way. Because when troubles come, we often don't. We have to learn how to trust God that way. And that's exactly what Jesus says. If we go back to the passage in the Sermon on the Mount, he says in verse 25, therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life. And therefore, that means for this reason or because of this, Jesus is saying, for this reason or because of this, don't worry about your life. But then you have to ask, well, what reason? Because of what? Because of what I've just said, there is no need to worry about your life. So remember, in the Sermon on the Mount, they're not a series of isolated points, but a coherent talk, and there's a sequence to Jesus' logic. And we see it here again. So Jesus is saying, because of what I've just said, there's no need to worry. And what has he just said? He's really made two main points. The first point is that we stop getting our sense of worth and identity and value from what people think of us. Instead, we get that from God. And the second, Thing that he said is we stop depending on what we have for our security and for our future we depend and trust God so Jesus is saying the only way to escape anxiety and worry is to let go of these two things to let go of finding your worth and your identity and your value from what people think of you and to let go of finding your security in your job or in your money or in your pension or in your qualifications and when you let go of those things, you learn by the Spirit that there is no need to worry because God is your Father and He's caring for you. We would never think that way. We would never think that way because in the world, the basis of not worrying is being healthy, having enough money, having good relationships. That makes sense. But at this stage in the Sermon on the Mount, we're getting used to expect Jesus' gospel, Jesus' teaching to be foolishness in the eyes of the world. Now, we have covered both these topics in the previous two weeks. The topic of uh, being set free from the opinion of others, being set free from uh, the rulership of money. So I'm not going to revisit them in detail, but there, I do want to bring out one aspect about this security um, lately that I've, I've seen in myself and you might see in yourself. Me and Deb were both 60 next year. And as one does, one begins to think about pensions and the need for them and how they are basically how you're going to live on when you're older. Actually, and it's, for us, it's not that much older. A few weeks ago, I had to go and get a public services card and the person behind the counter said, you know what, this is only going to last you a couple of years because in a few years they're going to give you a new one because you'll be an old age pensioner and will be entitled to free travel. And it was the first time anyone ever had said you're almost an old age pensioner. And it was kind of like, oh gosh, I'm getting up there. But as I was thinking about my pension, I realized 
that my worldview was that my pension, hopefully, would determine my future. Like I knew my life was in God's hands. And I knew that if our pension would be big enough, our future would be secure. And then this verse came to mind. No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. And then Jesus goes on to say, therefore I tell you, don't worry about your life. And I realized it's really very subtle, this thing about where you find your security. At least it's subtle in me. I realized that my trust and security was in God and in my material well-being, my pension. Like maybe it isn't a pension thing for you. Maybe somewhere inside your future would be secure if you could get a visa to stay in Europe or a job with a, you know, a big tech company. Or maybe your future would be secure if you could buy a house or you could get married. It's really very subtle. Finding your security in things and God. And that sneaks in without us even knowing it. You see, learning to live a worry-free life isn't a matter of getting rid of all troubles. The solution is a spiritual one. It's getting to know the Father as he really is, our good shepherd who is sufficient. The solution isn't changing the circumstances. Actually, Jesus, although we are told to pray to be delivered from evil and from trials, but it's not the solution because Jesus is saying you're going to have trouble every day. The solution is to understand who our Father is. Right thinking about our Father and acting on that right thinking is what will set us free from a life of worry. So as you think about this and this life of um, being in the kingdom of God, what Jesus has said that there's two big hindrances. One is seeking the approval or living your life when there's other people in your audience rather than Jesus alone. And the second one is that basing your security in money, our financial well-being, our security. Now, most of us don't do that, but also basing it in money and God. And those two things will undermine our life in the kingdom of God. And when we allow Jesus in there and to begin to develop the practices like secrecy and generosity that will break the power of those, we will begin to see and experience God as he is and begin that long journey, that long education of living a worry-free life because the Lord is my shepherd and because he is my shepherd, I shall not be in want. So let's just pray. Lord Jesus, This really is where the rubber meets the road, allowing you into those places, those deep ways of thinking, of understanding the world and how it works and what safety looks like and, and what value looks like. Would you begin surgery in us, in our ways of thinking, in the, what we value, so that we could begin to develop those practices that would allow you by your spirit set us free from worry because our Father knows we need these things. And we just need to seek first him and his kingdom. Help us to be those type of people, Lord. Amen.
everything that is in your heart, even if you don't know how to sing, just sing it. Father, we thank you for being here today with us in the online service. We also thank you that you are with our brothers and sister in, sisters and in the in-person service. And we thank you that you're everywhere and we worship you for that. We pray that you would give us a good week and that you would help us in that journey of being with you, learning to be like you, to do the things that you do. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. So now, as you can imagine, we have come to the end of our service. And once again, I remind you that today we have started our in-person services in the YMC 89th Street, the same place where we used to meet. And if you want to be part of that, there's a limited space for that. There's space for only 50 of you um, following government regulations. And if you want to attend, one of, uh, to attend that service, you need to go to dublinvineyard.ie and you will be able to get to get a free ticket there we need to follow a lot of guidelines and and regulations to make sure that everyone's safe so we do need you to uh, get a ticket and it's for free so don't worry about it about any cost or any any of that um, and you can get that once again at Dublin Vineyard that i e and if you got a ticket and for some reason you cannot make it i may just remind you that uh, you, you can do the same thing. You can cancel the ticket and open up the space for someone else to attend this service. So I hope you have a good week. I hope you have a good rest of the Sunday. And we will see you again next week at 10.30 a.m. here online and at 11 a.m. next Sunday in the YMCA. Ciao.